there in the in the Q and A, and we'll monitor that. Um, just before we start, I, I want to give a tiny little bit of background to to the question that we're raising today, the question that we're going to be discussing. Our three eminent panelists will be helping us with it. How do we know if and when science makes a difference? And historically, it's 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 interesting that there, there was a time, certainly from our own discipline, which is which is uh, psychology. So when I'm not being the editor in chief of the South African Journal of Science, I'm a professor of psychology at Stellenbosch University. There was a time uh, when people believed that scientists automatically held authority. And in the history of psychology, there are um, a number of uh, notorious experiments which were conducted uh, just after the Second World War, which were complicated ethically, but which did demonstrate that if somebody put on a white coat and, and called himself, and it usually was a him, uh, a scientist, people would be very obedient because the assumption was science is good for all of us. And if a scientist says what, what, what we must do, we must listen. Um, and I think as everybody knows, we are now in a, in a situation where in some senses, it's exactly the opposite, where um, there's a lot of suspicion about science, um, a lot of attack in the context of, of, of COVID on, um, on scientists and scientific knowledge, a lot of mistrust with mistrust of vaccines and so on. This is a really good time to be talking about the issues we're going to be talking about today. And I think, although it's a very difficult time for scientists and for our, our credibility and authority, which we can no, certainly no longer take for granted, um, I do think that there's one very good thing that has come from this, and uh, that is that um, scientists are called to, to, to ask the question, how do we know? How do we know whether our science makes a difference for society? And we've got three wonderful speakers who are going to help us with this quite complex problem, actually. And uh, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, not going to introduce all of them at once. I'm going to int introduce them uh, speaker by speaker, and we've decided to, to go uh, alphabetically by surname. And I'm absolutely delighted that the first speaker that we have is Dr. Mwazvita Dalu, who's from the Department of Geography at uh, the University of South Africa, and she's also associated with the Open University in UK. She's an uh, in innovation postdoctoral research fellow um, at, at UNISA, and really has, a, has um, an interest in people's relationship with uh, the environment. But she tells me she's, she's going to tell you a bit more about that um, herself. So I don't want to steal her thunder. But one, one thing I do want to tell you, something you, you probably didn't know about Dr. Dalu, is that she was once a self-proclaimed rapper and singer-songwriter for a music group. And it, I think it's very appropriate what the name of this group was for this discussion. The name was Mirror to Society. And she says that she's relieved there was no YouTube then. But then I thought, you know, this is about Mirror to Society and so on. So I think um, I feel a little disappointed if she's not going to give her whole talk in rap today. Um, I'm, uh, I don't think she is, but we're absolutely delighted. And each of our speakers will speak for about 15 minutes, and then we'll have some general discussion. So over to you, Moisvita. Thank you very much for agreeing to be part of our panel. Thank you so much, Leslie. I am very excited to be um, a part of this discussion. Um, it was a very warm, uh, warmly received uh, invitation when I received it um, from the Journal of Science, um, who I've also published with and have some very exciting things to share about the relationship we've had. Um, I think it was last year when something quite exciting happened, but it'll be part of the presentation. I'm um, sorry I will be disappointing you. I will not be wrapping today, but uh, you can keep my contact details at hand uh, for the future when COVID finally is a thing of the past. I think I'll relaunch my career as a birthday entertainer. So do, do stay in touch there. Without taking too much time, um, I'm going to start start sharing my screen and um, get into the presentation. Um, so let me just uh, open that. I hope you'll be able to, to see it. Um, and then I'm just going to start. Yes, we can see. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. All right. Okay, let's... Sorry, I'm just trying to... 
Here we go. All right, so the F5 wasn't working on this one. There we go. Okay, perfect. Okay, so my name is Dr. Mojita Dalu. I'm working under the mentorship of Professor Ashley Ganta at, the, at UNISA, and I'm also part of um, the Open University. I'm a research associate on one of their projects at the moment that is working on uh, decolonial education and uh, peace in Africa. And it's going to span for another two years after this year and is actually involving several countries, including South Africa um, and, and three other countries on the continent. Just to start us off on my presentation, I think this is a hobby that we're all familiar with, watching movies. Um, I thought I would start off with an introduction there and show you a very short clip from a movie that was produced in 2004. It's called Day After Tomorrow. And uh, I think many of us are going to relate to the initial feelings of the scientist who was involved in a research having realized that something catastrophic is going to happen to the world and it's going to end and his struggle to be noticed. But fortunately for him, perhaps not an experience that most of us will be familiar with, the government finally invited him. The US military went out and saved the entire world and all was well, thanks to, to science. So, well, that was a fictional depiction of uh, climate change at uh, some point um, in the world. Um, please note that uh, it is fiction and it's, it's not stating the actual facts. They're just um, manipulating it. And I was just using this to show us perhaps what would be the reality versus the dream for, for many of us. I'm sure even uh, as we're sitting within this global crisis, there are some amongst us who in their fields of study and science did see something like this happening and uh, are probably seething somewhere watching the news thinking I told you so um, but um, well fortunately in this movie the dream where the government comes and they consult science although a little bit late um, they did uh, finally see the difference that science made and so we go back to a very primary um, figure here um, that I have at the top where we have the source, we have the message and we have an audience and we have the different channels of communication that are happening in the feedback mechanisms from an audience back to the source. And so here I am uh, using this, doc this uh, particular figure to see our relationship um, with the people or with society where we want to make a difference. Um, I think it's safe to say that um, science, the purpose of science is really for us to, to, to better society, for us to, to uh, develop for the sake of humanity, sustainability, for the future generations to also um, share in a, in a safe future, one that is conducive for them. And so as scientists, we have to shape our messages such that our audiences can receive them in such a way that they're able to use them. But what's also happening, um, as you can see, is that you can have um, the source and the audience also having some communication that's also direct. And in that way, making a difference would be easier because the link is, is very direct. But once you have channels of communication, and I think a lot of us find challenges in that, that you do do your research, you do due diligence, you do um, the science and you give it, then there's something that happens within the channels. You find that there's a lot of noise. Um, very often there's red tape. Um, that's there. So just below here is a table um, that shows an example of how research impacts, how it makes a difference by the setting and the time frame. And of course, this one is the one that is directed to, to government, um, whereby we can start to see differences in the short term, we can see differences in the medium term, and we can see differences in the long term um, in the example of um, policy making and interacting with them. Uh, with the government. Of course, in practice, what that would mean for us, how can we start seeing that something is going on? And one of the most popular ways that we have been seeing our, our difference or the impact that we're making is through our publications, how they're received, um, evidence by citations, the number of downloads. Um, and we've also started to see that it's being driven more and more today by social media um, as well. And also the mass media is also contributing to this. In the longer term, in practice, our studies have been 
have been used in reviews where people are going back and um, uh, revamping them to solve uh, current dilemmas. And then we start to see our studies cited in policy documents as the practitioners of policy themselves start to, to use them. And so we start to see interventions um, in the very longer term, but in the shorter term, it's not, it's not so grand. Um, very often it's, 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 it's uh, a policymaker comes in and sits, perhaps they attend um, one of our presentations that we have here and they acknowledge that they've, they've, heard, they've heard us and they do state a commitment at some point to use our evidence. Um, and also um, when we see, when we roll out education pro uh, programs, perhaps maybe we can run assessments and we can see that people understand or at least they're giving an indication that they do understand what we're, we're trying to, to go on. Um, and so these are the kind of different settings where we can start to see differences. But as you can see, these are not the only settings that we would have to make differences. Very often, it's not all of us who are, who are able to talk to policymakers. The audience is different for all of us. And also the timeline is different and even the scaling of, it, of itself. And so we also need to start um, thinking about the who, to whom we're making a difference? At what level? Is it individual? Is it a regional? Is it national? Is it global? And who is our audience? And then we start to think about the channels. We start to think about the messages that we are going to be using. So I'm just going to give an example of what my making a difference at the moment looks like. Of course, uh, um, we do have our, our typical metrics where we have your citations, where we have our publications as well. Um, but what I am particularly um, interested in in this discussion, hopefully, is just the idea of difference in collaboration. Um, I think science, we're starting to broaden out much more um, and understanding that there is power in collaborating and perhaps even outside of our own strict scientific discipline, as it were. And it is within these projects that we're finding privileges to make a difference. But that being said, our metrics, perhaps how we see, how we measure making a difference for us, they might be a little bit of a complication that's there because me measuring is in consistency is also something that we as scientists value. It is part of our practice and we're staunch about it. And so we find ourselves in a bit of a complication as we move forward. Um, in my journey of making a difference, I've been very fortunate to collaborate in, 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 project, in projects within the, the, the community itself and was privileged to get audience of um, mass media where BBC News actually picked up an article that I was involved in um, about wetlands and uh, the society itself. Um, and so that to me would be something I can say is evidence of something is going on in terms of making a difference. And then with the South African Journal of Science, um, we, we published um, an issue with regards to how knowledge is generally produced and how it's received. And um, it was also picked up by the South African radio station SAFM. And there was a very good discussion that involved people. It was a talk show and people, the general public were also interested and had an opportunity to share their opinions. And I think for, for, for us as, as the writers of that, it was really about trying to, to put these ideas into people's minds and try to, to, to get people to start to understand that we are at a, a, a present of change. And for, for me, that would have been a measure sufficient of, um, of, of difference. And of course, there's the publications. Um, um, there's uh, the very popular uh, high impact journal Nature, which we also got audience with with one of our our publications, and so that would form part of my journey of um, making a difference. Now, where we are, we are trying to decide what then happens with the future of impact. There's been some debates about the use of publications, the H index citations, is the only measure of impact, or at least the one that's mostly recognized within our very own community, um, not to mention our outside of our own community as the, as, as the scientists. And um, this has um, been talked about for years. And uh, here I present a 2012 uh, report that was presented by um, Dutch funders. So um, 
in the, in the Netherlands. Um, just a moment. There's about uh, five of them who came to write this white paper report, and it was in the interests of trying to see how we can better accommodate collaboration and to better accommodate the different um, talents that we have, even as a scientific community. And so they started to say that diversifying and vitalizing career paths would be something that we need to consider, for example, if we're going to start measuring different, um, differently. They wanted to be more open. So the idea is about opening up science. So it's not only about research, which is the way that we've often communicated within ourselves and to the community, but with leadership. And then there's that word impact that um, I think we're going to be discussing a lot more in, in, in this um in this, in this uh, panel discussion. As a result of um, such reports, this one being one of them published in 2012, this year, um, a university, Utrecht University, has actually made a commitment to completely drop the, imp the use of the impact factor um, in considering academic promotion, academic hiring. Um, and so some of the things that they say about this is that it's just become a production nation of our science and now the what they are calling good science um, and of course good is quite subjective but they're saying good science has been left out and has been left behind so these are the things that i think we want to to start to 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 think about in making a difference and so the impact factor is being said it's it's inadequate um, and that it's failing to modify the current assessment system because we're still emphasizing it quite a lot. And um, the funders, many, many of the funders, the European funders are also acknowledging that open science is more important in policy and decision making. And so it's now necessary that even institutions start to, to follow suit. And so these are the, the, um, the main um, systematic changes that they would want academics and researchers to consider. So to just acknowledge that we're individual, the independence, but also that the collaboration, when we open up and we come in our different um, strengths, then perhaps we'll be able to, to speak better to our audience. Perhaps our message becomes more impactful and uh, perhaps even our link to the, the audience becomes more direct as we start to involve people that are from other, from, from other fields. However, on a practical level, this becomes very difficult. And I think that's where we are. This is the juncture where we are and that's what we're discussing. Then how do you then evaluate a researcher beyond what we has been easy for us to measure, which is our impact factor, that is a, a threat and our citations um, um, at, at the moment. Um, because of that, we're also seeing that a lot of the, the, the major research hubs of the world, Canada, the USA, they're still retaining um, the idea of impact factor as um, what they use to, to review, to promote, and to give tenure to, to academics. And so it's going to be quite difficult to, to shake this off um, as a measure of impact. Yeah. And- um, Dr. Dalla, uh, um, can, can I just ask you to uh, wrap up quite as quickly as you can? Thanks, we've just got a time problem. Thanks so yes, much. Yeah. Yeah. Not a problem. Well, um, I think I'll just leave it at that, really, where if other people are now not looking at the impact factor and others are, are still looking at the impact factor, then there's going to be feelings of insecurity amongst the future of, um, of acad younger academics. And I think that's where we end today. Thank you very much for, for giving me the time to, to bring some issues to the fore. Um, that will be the end of the presentation. Thank you so much, Dr. Dollar. That was a, a real model. You're talking about science communication and we had a model of science communication there. And I'm sure I'm not alone in, in, in wishing that we had a whole hour just to, to listen to you. And I, I feel very bad sort of stopping you uh, at, at, at the end, but we, we, we do have to be done by 12 o'clock and we have two other excellent speakers. The first of whom is uh, Dr. Ernest Dubé who is from the School of Natural Resource Management at Nelson Mandela University. And he's a, um, uh, works in ag agricultural uh, plant, plant research. And he's also an avid chess player. And he says that chess is about 
problem solving, building critical thinking and prediction skills. And agronomy is also about problems, problem solving. So there's a relationship between his chess playing and agronomy. Um, over to you, Dr. Dr. Dubé, for your 15 minutes or so. Uh, thank you so much, Prof. Squats. Uh, it is a pleasure to be joining you. I'm excited. We haven't been getting a lot of chances to speak about what we do since the advent of COVID. And uh, so I thank you so much for this opportunity where I'm going to share with you uh, my take about the impacts of uh, agronomy uh, research. So I'm just going to share with you a screen here of a presentation which I've prepared. Um, Right, we can see your screen. Ah, uh, thank you. All right, let me um, put it onto the um, slideshow. All right. Uh, does it look okay? It looks perfect. Ah, uh, thank you. All right. So, <clears throat> I'd like to begin by defining what is agronomy. I think uh, from what I've come across in a um, uh, course, it's a sometimes misunderstood what agronomists really do. So agronomy um, is um, my passion and uh, it is the application of science and technology from various disciplines for the improvement and management uh, of the major food crops uh, of the world. And we, we're talking about uh, our staple crops here, such as wheat and maize. So agronomy uh, research thus uh, integrates many sciences, such as soil plant, uh, soil science, uh, plant science, wheat sciences, and other related disciplines, such as um, ecology, entomology, climatology, sociology, and uh, agricultural economics. The success of farmers in, in field crop production really depends on how well they are, apply, they are able to apply the knowledge which is born out of agronomy research. So one special thing about uh, agronomy research is that uh, the impacts are, are, are felt uh, almost immediately. Most of the research is uh, practical. And um, uh, unlike other disciplines where you, you, you tend to have um, indirect impacts and a long period of time before maybe there's uptake of the technology. In agronomy, we, we are working with farmers uh, all the time and uh, hence the work that we do, as long as it is um, addressing farmer problems, it is usually uh, taken up, the technologies are usually taken up immediately and the impact is usually there for everybody to see. I would say um, if, you, if, you, if you actually ate today, you, you have to thank uh, the progress which has made in agronomy research science for the meal that you had. Um, we, we're living in a world where the population is increasing, especially here in, in uh, developing countries. Uh, it has stagnated a bit in developed countries, but we're still having population increase in developing countries. And hence, we have got more mouths to feed. And yet, our land area is not increasing. We also having uh, climate change as a challenge. And uh, this, this is causing uh, increased frequency of droughts, pests, and diseases. The soil fertility is continuously declining as we have been harvesting from the land. And uh, most importantly, because we are faced with uh, limited uh, our land, uh, which is competing with other needs, we have to have uh, continuously uh, research which is aimed at increasing our yields and also addressing these uh, increasing challenges. Uh, so agronomists have got to carry out um, uh, research uh, continuously on how to overcome these challenges working hand in hand with the farmers. 
So this is um, why uh, agronomy research is very important and why the impacts are felt uh, almost immediately. I'm going to, I would like to um, use the wheat production sector as an example of how we, we are able to measure the impacts of agronomy research uh, here in, in South Africa. I have worked uh, a lot on wheat research myself before. And uh, as you are probably all aware that uh, wheat is, is now the, the most important or the second most important crop in South Africa after maize because of increasing urbanization and uh, also um, because uh, the diets of people are, are changing more towards uh, uh, wheat products as the income levels increase. So annual consumption currently is 3.2 million tons and uh, it is increasing. So wheat agronomy research in South Africa continues to contribute immensely to the increase in wheat yield uh, and, uh, and, uh, and thus uh, food security. Wheat production um, started in the 1600s in South Africa uh, by the arrival of Shan van Rebeck when they first planted wheat uh, around the 1652 in the Western Cape. And uh, the first wheat breeding program was uh, uh, founded in 1891. Um, we started off with very slow yields of around maybe two, 0 0.5 tons per hectare. You, you would have been lucky in the, in the back then to get uh, half a ton per hectare of wheat, but by, um, by about um, 1983, uh, our average yield for wheat had increased to a ton per hectare. There's been uh, much more investments in research and development for wheat, uh, especially breeding work uh, over the past four years. And we now stand at a national average yield of 2.7 tons per hectare which is uh, very, very remarkable. It's like three times uh, increase over the past four years. So uh, over the past 40 years. So you, you can see from there that without the research efforts uh, uh, in, in agronomy, um, the price of bread could be as much as three times higher than what it is currently. Uh, baking quality has also been increased by approximately 20% and uh, uh, because of this, we, I, I can say that we, we, we now enjoy better quality bread, uh, yet at a cheaper price, and uh, bread has remained uh, affordable to, to most people. Uh, we give that uh, credit to the continual uh, investments in uh, R&D uh, uh, for wheat. Uh, again, because uh, of research, our food is increasingly becoming safer because of uh, less pesticide use. We've got a lot of uh, research currently dedicated uh, around uh, reducing our reliance on uh, toxic um, pesticides, uh, also for the sake of uh, in environmental protection. We currently have a very challenging environment for farmers in terms of profitability of farming and for farmers to stay in business and for them to remain profitable and competitive on the open market, they have to be always uh, uh, adopting the, the latest uh, technology and, and um, innovation. The wheat production sector is critically important to, to the country. Uh, to the economy as it contributes employment to employment creation along the, the whole value chain through farm workers, uh, millers, bakers, and uh, shop owners. And hence, uh, it, is, it is quite important that uh, um, the research which is done uh, by agronomists in the wheat uh, uh, sector um, keeps us, um, ensures uh, that the, this wheat industry continues uh, to survive. Otherwise, it will be a catastrophe. There are some people who have argued that we could um, 
import wheat uh, as a, if we are not producing enough wheat in the country, but uh, obviously that would be not good in terms of uh, national sovereignty and food uh, security. We cannot be relying on other countries for our staple. What if those countries wake up and close the borders and say, uh, we are not going to be uh, 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 allowing you to import our wheat anymore for various uh, political reasons. So it is very important that uh, we continue to increase uh, wheat uh, uh, yield. And, and uh, as we see wheat yield increasing in the country and wheat production, the credit is, uh, those are the, some of the impacts of uh, uh, agronomy research. Another uh, um, Dr. Jibbe, you have about four minutes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Prof. Um, another critical issue which, which is affecting farming in South Africa is the issue of land degradation and soil erosion through uh, uh, tillage practices. So agronomy research um, is helping farmers to conserve the soil for the benefits of future generations. And whenever um, we we have um, farmers, uh, new farmers implementing conservation agriculture practices, for example. This is uh, one of the success stories and impact of uh, agronomy research. We, we, at the present, nearly all the farmers that are producing wheat in the Western Cape province uh, have converted to conservation agriculture uh, and are applying the research results of from most of the conservation agriculture research, which was done over the past decade or so in the country, whereby we had very little adoption of uh, conservation farming uh, practices. And uh, again, the conservation agriculture practices are keeping, uh, are helping farmers to reduce production costs, uh, thus keeping the price of uh, uh, wheat uh, and other farm pro products uh, affordable. There is uh, another challenge of various pests and diseases which are continuously evolving because of climate change. Um, almost every year there is new uh, races of, uh, uh, pest, uh, of pesticide resistant um, uh, pests which are, have got to be tackled through new innovations uh, around agri uh, agronomy research. And, uh, at, at the present moment, we in the country, we have got uh, a shortage of wheat. We need uh, about 3.2 million tons, but we are only producing 2 million tons. Uh, the, the, the demand for wheat uh, is increasing, and uh, this uh, calls in the need for uh, agronomy research, where uh, as we, we, we envisage that we're going to be meeting these targets in the near future. As we look at the current um, rates of breeding progress that have been achieved uh, through uh, breeding research. So in conclusion, I would say that uh, the new innovations brought about by wheat agronomy research uh, continue to help farmers uh, increase wheat yields and address various challenges that are uh, we're currently facing in the wheat sector, hence national food security. And uh, I would say, as I've mentioned previously, if uh, we're continuing to have bread and eating it uh, and uh, daily, then this is uh, um, an impact of uh, agronomy uh, research in the country, just one example. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, thanks. Thanks very much. And my apologies for having to cut everybody short. I mean, that was, was also a fascinating uh, presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Dubé. Um, we're moving on to uh, Professor uh, Jennifer uh, Fitchett, um, who is an Associate Professor of Physical Geography at the University of the Witwatersrand, and, and she works in biometeorology amongst uh, other areas. and. Uh, Jen is also a very valued associate editor, actually, of our journal, the South African Journal of Science. My apologies about the time, but um, over to you, Jen. Thank you. 
Thanks, Leslie, and hi, everyone. Um, for some reason, my background is not working, so you're going to have my uh, paintings and bookcases to deal with here. Um, I'm just going to share my screen quickly in the interests of time. Um, right, so I am not going to be speaking. Uh, just want to check. Can everyone see the screen in, in presenting? Yes. Um, so I'm not going to speak any way specific to biometrology. I'm going to step back on this question and ask um, how do we know if and when science makes a difference far more broadly. Um, and so what I'm going to be uh, talking about firstly is just asking the, the very broad question of when does or perhaps does not science make a difference. And I think crucial to that is asking ourselves what a difference means. And I would put forward the provocation that science always makes a difference. Uh, that the pursuit and production of new knowledge and the process um, that is involved in this pursuit and production of new knowledge and the engagement with knowledge as a tangible and often um, a growing outcome is something that is in itself inherently making a difference. And that any piece of work we do in the sciences, whether it's in the physical sciences or in the social sciences, is contributing stepping stones for future work. And so even if we don't think that one particular piece of work is groundbreaking, it makes a difference in allowing somebody else to stand on the shoulders of that piece of work or of those researchers and to enable future work, future developments and future breakthroughs. So I'm going to hold this provocation that science always makes a difference throughout my talk, but perhaps let's take a step back and think more tangibly. I think we would all agree that science makes a difference when we have a breakthrough or a discovery, or when we come around to a solution for a particular pro problem, or perhaps even when we just raise awareness for a problem, when we're raising awareness for issues such as um, uh, tropical diseases or climate change when we are improving ac uh, accuracy and improving the understanding of an issue, and when we're encouraging young people to enter the sciences or addressing social ills, any of these things would be very tangible markers of science having made a difference. And each of these could be quite quantitatively measured to determine the level of difference that has been made. And I know earlier we heard about the um, impact factor as being one measure of this, but I'd argue that through breakthroughs, discovery, solutions, awareness, understanding, accuracy, and um, encouraging people to enter the sciences and addressing social ills, that we've got this very wide uh, measure of impact and that any kind of impact makes a tangible difference. But I'd also argue that the very process of conducting science will always make a difference. That when we're going through the motions of conducting research, when we're in the process of training our researchers and our future leaders, when we are communicating our research findings, whether via publications or science communication or through platforms such as this, and when we're using research to inform policy, in all four of those cases where science is being conducted and both through process and output, science in and of itself makes a difference. Of course, we do need to recognize that difference is not always a good thing. We know that science has also and continues to drive some of the world's greatest problems. We also know that what might be a solution now could be detrimental down the line. And we have to be very cautious about the butterfly effect. Something that seems to have a very small impact now could well be impacting on a number of other systems and may have a much greater impact years down the line. So when we say that science always makes a difference, it's not always making a positive difference or the uh, difference is not always a net positive or the difference is not always positive in the long run. So what else should we as scientists then be asking in the context of this discussion? I would argue that first and foremost, we as scientists need to argue and ask ourselves, what difference do I as a scientist want to make? How am I defining difference? And what do I want that difference to be? And what do I want that legacy of me as a scientist and my scientific work and my scientific process and my scientific output to be? The second is how will I measure whether I'm making a difference? What are my metrics? What is important to me? Is it an impact factor? 
Is it the number of students that I graduate? Is it a patent? For each of us as scientists, those measures will be slightly different. They depend on the discipline that we're working on. They depend on the conventions in a particular country or at a particular university. But they also depend on us as an individual and our value systems and what is of critical importance to us. And so we need to think about how we measure how we're making a difference. The next thing is asking ourselves how we will determine whether the difference we are making provides that net positive outcome for the world. Now, next week, next year, and in perpetuity. How do we know that there is net benefit to what we're doing? And again, I think it depends on how you're defining it. Any student who graduates, that is a net benefit to the world. That's somebody who's been educated. But when we're talking about some, um, some of the work that could have a detrimental output, how we weigh up the positives and the negatives of those types of research. And then finally, how can I improve the impact of my science? Impact is, as we heard right at the beginning of this webinar, so crucial to the difference that science can make and the difference that science has a potential to make. And impact is broad. So what does impact mean for you? What does impact mean for your science? And how can you work to continually improve that impact? And then what should we as society be asking? I would provocate that we should be asking first and foremost, how do we support science and recognize these less tangible differences or impacts that science has to make? I would argue secondly, that we need to think about how we as a society can encourage science for good. And what science for good means and what organizations that are working towards science for good are actually trying to achieve and how we can play into that. What does it mean to encourage it? How do we encourage scientists? How do we engage with them? Third, I would argue that as society, we should be arguing how we allow for more people working in the sciences to be able to see and value and recognize the difference that they make. Far too often we see people who are working in the sciences who become very despondent, either that what they're doing is not enough or what they're doing does not address the world's major challenges of poverty, of uh, health issues. And it's important that we as a public are recognizing these scientists, encouraging these scientists and helping them to see the difference that they're making and helping them to celebrate that. And finally, I'd argue that as a society, we need to argue and we need to ask how best we can learn from the outputs of science and looking for all of the outputs, not just the outputs that make it into nature or science or the outputs that make it to the front page of our local newspaper. How do we actively engage with science? How do we learn from it? And how do we develop our ability to actively engage with scientific output and to do so in a reliable uh, way that is understanding of the scientific process? And then I'll end with, what does it actually mean to make a difference? I argued from the beginning of my talk that all of science makes a difference and that the process of science, the output of science will always make a difference even if it is quite small, or even if that difference is there primarily as a stepping stone for future work. But I think it's important to keep asking, what do we mean by making a difference? And what does a difference constitute? And how do we tangibly measure that? Because if we understand what it means to make a difference, we can work towards science for good. We can work towards a society where we are engaging with our scientists in the most productive manner. And we can work towards a situation where we are trying to do the best in terms of a net positive overall. And so with that, I'll close. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Fitchett, for, for that uh, wonderfully brief and wonderfully pro provocative presentation. And I'm, uh, I'm sure that everybody, all the 73 people who are on this meeting will agree with me is that in a very short space of time, we've got three fascinating takes on what is a very complicated question. So uh, from Dr. Dalu, we had this fascinating story of um, the importance of science communication um, and showing practically 
what those various aspects are and troubling the narrowness of the metrics that, that we tend uh, uh, to use. We then heard a, a, about a specific uh, discipline, which is the discipline of agronomy from Dr. Dubé and how partnerships and relationships with, with people outside the science community are important in, in making the difference. And then we heard from, from Professor Fitchett, um, a really pro provocative and I think quite challenging talk in which she was troubling the very concepts that, that we use um, and was asking us, demanding of us, in fact, to think much more broadly about the concepts with, that we use and the questions that we ask. I see there are a few comments in the Q&A so far. Please feel free to, to add some more. And I'm going to, as the chair, I'm going to, to be uh, selective. Um, I'm, I'd like to ask the panelists to, to comment on this um, uh, question from Professor Anwar Moore, who says, uh, bringing science to the public is extremely important. This will also help to tackle anti-science attitudes and general anti-intellectualism that pervades the world. Scientists must use public platforms to explain what they do and why they are doing it. Would any of the three of you perhaps in, in order like to, in, in, in wrapping up, um, give a res response to that before we have our poll at the end of our, our meeting today? Um, uh, Dr. Dollar, would you like to respond to, to Professor Moore? Just um, for certainly. A yes, yeah. yes, I hope you can hear me. Should I? Yes, start my yes, I can, I can hear you well. Okay, perfect. Well, um, thank you very much for the for the comment. And indeed, I think it's it is very, very valid. Because um, like you said, there was that authoritative um attitude in the very beginning with science. If someone is wearing a lab coat, then surely whatever they say, um, is what goes, and I think that um, does not facilitate for a uh, for a rapport for the kind of relationship that we what we would want as scientists to have. Particularly now, as we are realizing that the world has become more interconnected, and as you rightfully say, the channels that we want to use to um, appeal to to the public for whom science is actually um, uh, created in the first place, um, they, they, they have to be um, more inclusive and uh, more, more familiar. And I think that interaction, uh, even uh, I think um, Professor Fisher was also saying that um, society also has to, to come back to us. They're the ones who tell us if it's working. They're the ones who give us the questions, perhaps that we should be developing the, the problems, but also we depend on them um, to, to, to support us. Um, first of all, the funding that we have, for example, I mean, I think that's a very measurable way of whether society is, 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 is in it for us. A lot of it is taxpayers' money, for example, and then there's donor funds. So that's society saying, listen, we want you to help us with this, and here's the resources that we're, that we're, that we're giving you. So we certainly do not want anti-science um, issues. And I think we do need to, to become relatable um, to them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Dubey, do you have a, a, a brief comment? I'm very frustrated by the limited amount of time we have. Dr. Dubey, would you like to make a comment? Uh, no, thank you, uh, Prof. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And Professor Fitchett? On this, on this issue? See, um, yeah, I, I would agree completely with this comment. I think that bringing science to the public is incredibly important. And it's very important that we do so in a responsible and a sensitive manner. Um, I'm particularly excited by organizations such as the Conversation Africa, who are doing incredible work to get academics to write um, copy mm -hmm. for the public in a, a newspaper format to be able to communicate either their immediate research outputs or perhaps uh, prominent topics that are under discussion, whether it's the protests going on in KwaZulu-Natal or um, a, a drought taking place. I think it's really a, a very fantastic platform, but that we should also be thinking more broadly about how we as scientists feel comfortable communicating. And for some of us, it might be that uh, a podcast is more suited to us. It might be that a vlog is more suited to us. And I'd, I do agree that this needs to become part of the considerations around funding and that funding does allow us to uh, communicate to the public and it facilitates us in doing so. 
thank thank you there, there, there's so many fascinating i hope that people are following in the the q a we're not going to be able to unfortunately deal with um with all of the questions i i, I just want to to um point to to two points from from these which we won't have time to to discuss and answer in detail but just two issues that have been raised by and thank you to everybody who's who's raised issues in the q a um and the one is the 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 issue of the current mistrust in science and um, part of what we've been trying to understand during this talk is assist how do we and i mean it's an excellent question how do we as scientists assist the public and policy makers to, for to, to reinvigorate uh, trust trust in in science so that 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 i think is a really important issue that we've started talking about but there is much more discussion and um the 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 other issue which relates to this is the problem and i i think this this relates particularly to the the last presentation the the, the problem that that given mistrust in science, scientists and people who work within science become may become disillusioned to some extent. Um, and it's part of our role as, as scientists and part of why we at the South African Journal of Science are so grateful to the Department of Science and Innovation and the National Science Week for this opportunity. Part of our role is in fact to keep the morale of scientists up because if we don't have the morale of scientists uh, kept up and people excited about research and excited about research careers that's going to affect the the quality of science and the ability of science to make a difference I, um what 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 we would like for all um, for, from all of you and um, uh, we're now drawing to a close unfortunately um is um for you please to share your opinion of the um of of to today's talk through through i think i see, I see linda that you've shared it where, where it's been shared in the chat um so if you look it's been shared both in the q a and the chat there is a, a form please share your opinion of this event with the organizers of national science week you can find that either from uh, Linda in the chat, or you can also find it in the q a it's very important for us in trying to do what this talk has been about, which is to keep science relevant, to keep making sure that there's a difference, to know whether we're doing the right thing or the wrong thing. Um, so, so please do answer that. Um, I'm very grateful indeed to um, to uh, all of our panelists for the excellent range of talks that we had, and 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 for. Um, uh, sticking to time or allowing me to interrupt you that's that's always very um fr frustrating um as you'll see there are a series of other events after this one um uh, in in the next few days um and please fill in the poll thank thank you very much indeed i just just